In 2015, we commemorated the 10th anniversary of the report by the Royal Commission to enhance the operation and management of the Royal Malaysian Police Force. The tremendous effort and scholarship that went into the report by that Royal Commission is visionary and its recommendations are commendable. The report by the Royal Commission addressed, and I quote, widespread concerns regarding the high incidence of crime, perception of corruption in the Royal Malaysian Police Force, PDRM, general dissatisfaction with the conduct and performance of police personnel, and a desire to see improvements in the service provided by the police, unquote. The report was generally focused on improving the abilities of the PDRM as a crime combating agency. It was not intended to be an attack on the PDRM. In this regard, the massive challenges confronting PDRM were acknowledged in the report, including findings of widespread, widespread corruption in PDRM, widespread non-compliance with prescribed laws and human rights obligations, among police personnel, and inadequate awareness and respect for the rights of women and children. The Royal Commission stressed that, owing to the nature of the job and the existing PDRM culture, the code of conduct within the force had failed to ensure supervision and command accountability in protecting the rights and interests of the public. The preoccupation of being a force as opposed to a service was at the heart of these concerns. In addition, the Royal Commission also identified the mounting incidents of deaths in custody, as well as the failure of the PDRM to investigate these deaths and the refusal of the authorities to hold inquests into them. Deaths in police custody under questionable circumstances are reprehensible and are an indictment of the PRM as an enforcement agency. To address these challenges, Dr. Kutubu Zaman has mentioned this, the Royal Commission made 125 specific recommendations and emphasized that internal oversight mechanism, the, the internal oversight mechanism in PDRM was, I quote, inadequate, unreliable, and frequently ineffective. The recommendations made by the Royal Commission were timely, far-reaching, and necessary to cure the systemic flaws in our policing system and to upgrade our police to a modern enforcement agency. One of the chief recommendations of the Royal Commission was the setting up of the Independent Police Complaints and Misconduct Commission, the IPCMC, an independent external commission tasked solely to receive and investigate complaints of misconduct and abuse against the PDRM. The Malaysian Bar today reiterates our call on the government to establish the IPCMC. This form of external oversight mechanism has been effective in meeting the challenges faced by the police force in other jurisdictions. It is seen as, a necessary, it is seen as necessary to enhance the ability of the PDRM to discharge their functions and to weed out the rogue elements within the force. In Malaysia, the IPCMC is particularly required given the continued and seemingly unabated occurrences of deaths in police custody and the other serious concerns over the conduct of police. Ladies and gentlemen, following the recommendations of the Royal Commission, the government initially took steps towards setting up the IPCMC with overwhelming support from civil society. Regrettably, its implementation came to a halt in 2006 after the PDRM strongly objected to it and reportedly threatened to let crime rise, to resign en masse and to vote for the opposition. Instead of reprimanding pre PDRM for these reforms, the government relented and downplayed the importance of establishing the IPCMC. The government then proposed to establish 
the Enforcement Agency, Integrity Commission, EAIC, as an alternative to the IPCMC, claiming that the EAIC would be able to provide the necessary oversight. The EAIC's mission is to strengthen the service delivery system with integrity amongst the Malaysian Enforcement Agencies to the management of complaints and investigations in a transparent, bold, dutiful and professional manner. The Enforcement Agency Integrity Commission Act of 2009, providing for the establishment of the EIC, was passed by the Devan Raya on the 1st of July 2009, four years after the IPCMC was first mooted. It took another 19 months for the EIC to officially begin operating on the 1st of April 2011. Regrettably, the EIC is a watered-down version of the IPCMC, and it would appear the managed structure the EIC was in fact designed to fail. First, the EIC is not wholly dedicated to receiving and investigating complaints of misconduct by the PDRM only. It has 19, it's a head, it has about 19 different government agencies under its purview. The agencies include PDRM, which has over 112,000 personnel, including the special branch, Ikatan Relawan Raya Malaysia Rela, which has over 3 million members, and the Malaysian Road Transport Department, which has over 8,000 personnel. Thus, the EIC's workload and focus is diverse, heavily, and unfortunately not specialized. In the recent supply bill table in the Devon Riot in October 2015 by the Prime Minister, the EIC's budget has been slashed by almost 40% from 7.7 .7 million ringgit in 2015 to, uh, to uh, propose 4.8 million ringgit in 2016. Based on the EIC staff directory access yesterday, the EIC has only 74 staff, down 6 compared to November 2015, of which only 11 are investigating officers. These are, these are insufficient funding, and the manpower, given the debt and the breadth of its responsibilities, is woefully lacking. Lastly, the EIC does not have any bite it can investigate and document a complaint and then submit its recommendations to PDRM, but it cannot com compel PDRM to accept or impl implement its recommendations. Furthermore, upon receiving the EIC's recommendations, the PDRM's inter internal display mechanism can ignore them and conduct its own investigations. Thus, there is duplication of work costing a waste of resources. But despite these shortcomings, as quite correctly recognized by the Tukutubu Zaman, there have been several cases recently where the EIC has performed in a commendable manner. Uh, and I will come to that very shortly. Apart from the EIC, there have also been reports of a proposal to establish an internal affairs division within PDRM after the Home Minister, Dr. Sri Dr. Dr. Ahmad Zaid Hamidi, visited the New York Police Department in 2014. An internal affairs division will lack the credibility and, and transparency of the external oversight by the IPCMC and will therefore be insufficient. In short, an internal oversight mechanism will not improve public perception of the PDRM nor invite public trust. Distinguished guests, today the names of Kugan Anandan, P. Karna Niti, and Damendran have become household names for all the wrong reasons. They have become part of the alarming statistics for deaths in public custody and a national gallery of shame for all of us. It is worrying that detainees in police custody continue to die under suspicious circumstances despite the matter having been repeatedly highlighted to the PDRM and the government. There has been an absence of full accountability on the part of PDRM and the government seems indifferent, largely indifferent, to the gravity of the problem. Statistics provided by the PDRM to the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia Suakam indicate that there were a total of 255 deaths in police custody between the year 2000 and 2014. This translates to, on a broad basis, an average of 17 deaths in police custody per year, or an average of one death every three weeks. 
These appalling numbers of unexplained deaths are unacceptable. Suakam noted that there were an additional four deaths in custody that were not reflected in PDRM statistics. And these are Said Mohammad Aslan, Said Mohammad Noor, who died in November 2014, less than 24 hours after being arrested by the police. 42-year-old P. Karuna Niti found death, uh, dead at the Tam Tamping Police Station lockup on the 1st of June 2013. 39-year-old C. Sukuma, who died on the 23rd of January 2013, while in the process of being arrested by the police in Kajang. 47-year-old Chandran Karuma was found dead on the 10th of September 2012 after being detained for four days at the Damwangi Police Station Lokka. According to Suaka, these four cases, three considered by the coroner's court and the other investigated by the EIC, found, found that injuries were caused by the police and these injuries contributed to the deaths. It follows that there should be a clarification from PDRM as to why these four cases were not reflected in their count of the total number of deaths in, public custody, in police custody. It appears inexplicable for these cases to have been left out without any explanation. Further, PDRM statistics also indicate that out of the 255 cases 2000 in the years 2000 and 2014, 207 or 81% recorded were attributed to health factors. 30 cases for 11% were from self-hanging, two slipped and died in the bathroom, and two died from fighting with another inmate. Only two deaths in custody were attributed to misconduct by the police. The Inspector General of Police, Nansi Khalid Abu Bakr, has attempted to explain away the severity of this problem of deaths in police custody, apparently reasoning the detainees who died were ill even before they were locked up. This is, with the greatest of respect, hardly a credible justification, as the lockup rules 1953 provides that as far as possible, medical officers shall conduct a medical inspection of the prisoner on admission. Even when a medical inspection is not possible, police officers are always obliged to ensure the safety and well-being of the detainees. In August 2015, Deputy Home Minister Dr. Noor Jaslan Muhammad downplayed the problem as well, stating that the proportion of deaths in police custody cases in the past 14 years is, I quote, very small, unquote, compared to the size of the police force that is 120,000 strong. The logic in that observation is difficult to comprehend and really escapes us. It can only be seen as apathy on the part of government to the damning state of affairs. Six days ago, on the 28th of April 2016, the EIC released its investigation findings of its public inquiry into the custodial death of N. Damendra to determine whether his death was a result of any misconduct, and if so, what caused or allowed the misconduct to occur, and who is responsible for that misconduct. Damendra was detained on the 11th of May 2013 and died 10 days later while in police custody at the Colombo Police Contingent Headquarters on the 21st of May 2013. Four police officers have been arrested and charged with causing Damindran's death. Their case is proceeding in court. The EIC found that Damindran's death in police custody resulted from the use of physical force by the police in violation of paragraph 33 of the IGP Standing Orders, Part A, 118, which prohibits the use of physical force against a detainee during interrogations. It also made findings on numerous fabrication, misrepresentation, and tampering of the lockup diary and police report regarding the death of Damindran by specified police officers. The EIC stated that the offenses may have been committed and the offenses may have been committed under sections 177, 182, 192, 201 and or 203 of the Penal Code. The AIC's chief recommendation was that disciplinary action be taken by the disciplinary authority of PDRM against the specified police officers for various acts of misconduct leading to the leading to and relating to the death of the Amendment. It further emphasized that the recurrence of deaths in custody and the use of force against the detainee is 
quote, a serious violation of law and integrity and is deeply regretted, unquote. It is most disappointing that the IGP's response to the EIC report has been to criticize the EIC and its chairman, saying that the matter, I quote, should not be discussed outside of the court as it can cause prejudice and is subjudice to the case, unquote. We are all aware there are provisions in the EIC Act of 2009 for the EIC to have proceeded to the inquiry and the criticism leveled against it is therefore misplaced. But the real issue is whether action will be taken against the other police personnel who have been implicated in the EIC's report and who have not yet been charged. The ongoing criminal trial of the four accused persons is not an excuse for non-action, particularly in the face of the scathing findings made by the EIC. The comments made by the EIC to improve the system and the functioning of the PDRM should also be taken, should also be taken into account and implemented. Next, last year, in October 2015, 30th October 2015, the EIC released its findings into the investigations on the custodial death of Syed Norman Aslan with Syed Norman No, Syed Aslan. The EIC found that the death involved the use of physical force by the police officers who conducted the arrest and interrogation. The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the chest. The post-mortem also found that the deceased had sustained 61 different injuries to his face, body and both legs. Some of the injuries were consistent with injuries sustained when defending himself from physical force inflicted upon him by the police officers. Third, police officers had tempered with the evidence by taking the following action, cleaning the scene of the incident before it was visited and inspected by the medical officer, destroying the rubber mat and carpet at the site of the deceased arrest that is believed to have been stained by his blood, and hiding the eyewitness who had, been, who had seen the arrest take place. They also found that the police had used handcuff, which that was not issued by PDRM, to cuff the deceased after his arrest, which contributed to injuries on the wrists of the deceased. There have been serious breaches of the standard operating procedure of the PDRM in relation to the procedure of the arrest and handling of the detainee. There was the element of conspiracy or Batman by PDRM officers to inflict del deliberate physical force upon the deceased, which resulted in injury and death. Such acts are offences under Section 203 and 325 of the Penal Court, Code read with, together with Section 34 of the Penal Code or alternately Section 107 of the Penal Code. Five days later, <clears throat> on the 4th of November 2015, the IGP pledged that any police personnel involved in the death in police custody of Syed Aslan would be brought to justice. Was that, that was laudable. There has been no further reports of any action taken against the police officers that, who have been identified by and in the EIC report. It will be reprehensible if, despite these damning findings, no action is taken in this case. Distinguished guests, the CPC, the Criminal Procedure Code, now mandates that an inquest must be conducted in every case of death in police custody. When a person dies while in police custody, the police officer who has had custody of that person must immediately notify the nearest magistrate of the death and the magistrate shall hold an inquiry into the cause of death. The coroner's court was established on the 15th of April 2014. However, the coroner's court that we have is not established under statute. It is set up under the sessions court and uses the criminal procedure code. It does not have important features of a typical coroner's court, such as a coroner who is specifically, especially trained and responsible for supervising investigations by the police, and a coroner who ensures that all relevant findings and evidence is gathered, as well as who presides over inquiries and makes findings. A year ago, on the 28th of January 2015, the coroner's court found that P. Karnanidhi was found dead, uh, dead in the Tantampin police lockup on the 1st of June 2013, and had died of a combination of unlawful acts and omissions by person or persons unknown. The court said, <coughs> and, I, and I quote, the deceased was a healthy adult male with no life threatening disease when he entered the lockup, but ended up dead three days later with 49 external injuries. The judge went on to say that it should have been, that should have rung alarm bells from the very beginning. 
The judge then listed three factors as causing P. Karnanidhi's death, including the multiple injuries caused by blunt objects, including through physical assaults, abuses, and unlawful acts by both police and fellow inmates. The judge said the police had failed to provide necessary medical care and attention that P. Karanidhi needed, as well as failed to stop other detainees from abusing the deceased in the police car. Yet another case that calls for the IPCMC. Amidst all these leak reports, the courts, our courts have been a shining beacon. The duty of the police is set out in very clear terms. In the leading judgment of Lord Bingham, an English case in the case of Amin, and I quote what Lord Bingham said, a state must not unlawfully take life and must take appropriate legislative and administrative steps to protect it. But the duty does not end there. The state owes a particular duty to those involuntarily in its custody. Such persons must be protected against violence or abuse at the hands of state agents. They must be protected against self-harm. Reasonable care must be taken to safeguard their lives and persons against the risk of possible harm." Unquote. Death in custody, especially under dubious conditions, is among the worst crimes one can imagine in a civilized society under the rule of law. The burden of, the burden of proving such a death did not occur by foul means must surely fall squarely on the law enforcement agency in question. The reasons are plain. The victim was being held in isolation, was wholly within the control of the detaining authority. Rarely are there independent witnesses to such a crime, as the witnesses are generally interested parties or persons under inquiry. And the police adhere to a strict chain of command, code, and bound by what is known as a blue wall of silence. The track record of one death in police custody every three weeks is a serious indictment of the PDRM. It harms the very soul of the of Malaysian society that lives have been lost under the supervision of the very officers who have the duty to protect and serve the public. It is commendable that there have been strong pronouncements from our court on custodial deaths. In the High Court case of Mama Anwar bin Sarek, Justice Lee Sui Seng said, and I quote, let the message go forth from this place that any more deaths in police custody would be one too many. Those with power to arrest and detain must ensure that the basic human rights of a detainee to seek medical treatment while in custody is immediately attended to. There should be no more wanted and wasted loss of life in police custody for every life is precious." Unquote. On the 8th of August 2014, when delivering the judgment of the Court of Appeal on the case of A. Kugan, who died in police custody in 2009, Justice David Wong said, and I quote, there should be zero tolerance to any custodial death in all remand centers in the country. And should custodial deaths happen, a public independent inquiry must be initiated, commensurate with the right of the family of the deceased to know when there is some doubt as to the cause of death. These strong pronouncements by our court strengthen the argument for an independent oversight body that could ensure and should ensure that there is zero tolerance of custodial deaths in our country. Ladies and gentlemen, in a recent news report, uh, and this was I think on the 19th of uh, April 2016, it was said that 58 out of the 704 lockups across the country have been equipped with RM 3.5 million self-monitoring, analytic, reporting technology or smart network of closed circuit cameras, CCTVs, to avoid any untoward incidents such as custodial deaths, suicide attempts, and also fights. Uh, also fights in custody. Now, this development is to be welcomed. It has also been reported that the system will be set up in stages at all lockups nationwide. Bukit Ahmad's manager, management director, Dr. Zulkifli Abdullah, stated, and I quote, in developing the CCC, CCTV system, PDRM sought Swakam's views on issues such as privacy and other fundamental human rights aspects. This recent development arises from the time the Home Minister, Dr. Sri Ahmad Zaid Hamidi, announced about two years ago, on the 9th of June 2014, that CCTVs would be installed in all police lockups. It will appear that CCTVs are being installed at a pace of approximately one lockup every two weeks. 
I now come to the shooting of Aminul Rashid. In April 2010, the nation was rocked by the news that a 14-year-old boy, Aminul Rashid Amza, had been shot in the head by the police during a police car chase when Aminul Rashid had driven his sister's car on a joyride. The police had fired 21 shots at the car when the car did not pose any threat to the public or the police officers in their patrol cars at the time, and without any knowledge of who the driver or any other possible occupants were. Last month, in a civil suit commenced by the family members of Amin Rashid, the Shah Alam High Court awarded the family damages totaling to 414,800 ringgit after holding the government, PDRM and IGP liable for the boy's death, resulting from the wrongful shooting and killing of the deceased by Corporal Jinani Sufi. The court further allowed a claim for the tort of public misfeasance or misfeasance in office against the IGP and awarded 100,000 ringgit damages. The findings, the High Court's findings in the IGP is of great concern, for this is not the first time that the IGP has been found liable for the tort of public misfeasance in public office. It also happened in the public, in the death in custody case of Kuban in 2009. As the head of the police force of the entire country, the IGP must set standards of high professionalism and integrity, it must not be a bad example to the rest of the police force. And then there were the recent reports that the daughter of the IGP and uh, his brother-in-law are involved in a company called Nilai Arms Ammunition Sundian Burhat. The IGP has responded to that. He has acknowledged the familial connections, but he has denied any conflict of interest. There's also a statement that family members of uh, a person should not be uh, uh, precluded from undertaking a business simply because uh, the person may be in a position of conflict. I make no presumption of conflict of interest, but I leave this to you to think about. Licenses are issued uh, by the chief police officer of a particular state. The chief police officer of a particular state is a subordinate of the IGP. Questions arise as to when an application is made for a license for arms and the details in that application, whether it would reveal a connection between the person who's buying the arms and who he's purchasing, who he or she is purchasing the arm from, arms from. If that leads to a company and, it, and if there's enough uh, information there to suggest that the company in any way is in any way related to, say, the IGP or senior police officer, then a very serious question arises. Is the decision making of the chief police officer influenced or uninfluenced by that fact? The proximity of business, in this case the business to supply arms, with the police cannot be denied. This is therefore a serious concern. And a concern like this should be resolved quickly. With the IPCMC, that concern can be resolved. In fairness to the person who is facing allegations of conflict of interest, as well as the persons who are making the allegations of conflict of interest. Unfortunately, we do not have such a mechanism, but there is reports, there are investigations, and we look forward to the investigations, to the findings in, the, in, the, in those investigations. Distinguished guests, the need for the IPCMC grows with each passing day. The serious allegations that the police misuse their investigation powers by detaining persons overnight particularly persons who have agreed to assist in police investigations and seeking oppressive remark orders to punish suspects prior to charge or conviction cannot be ignored. There are also new laws such as POCA and POTA, both provide for extremely wide powers of arrest where a police officer may without a warrant of arrest and keep, uh, without warrant arrest and keep in remand any person if there is reason to believe that grounds exist which justify the holding of an inquiry under these respective facts. With such enhanced powers of arrest, there needs to be more accountability to prevent abuse. Where do the persons who are faced with this arrest and detention, and then for year, months on and years on, nothing happens, where do those persons go in terms of making their grievances known to an independent body that could look into those grievances and decide whether or not those powers were properly used? It is here that an I IPCMC would be required. It would give the necessary transparency and credibility that would otherwise be lacking. I conclude by saying this, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. If the PDRM is serious in aspiring to be a world-class professional and disciplined police force, 
that embraces the values of integrity, efficiency, accountability and service, there is no reason, there is no reason for the PDRM to be resistant to the proposed IPCMC. The lack of accountability by the police must end. It must be courageous enough to submit itself to the IPCMC, an independent external oversight commission that is dedicated to the police force. Only then can the PDRM develop itself into an institution that lifts up to its motto, and I quote, Tegas Adil Dan Berhama, firm, fair and prudent, and engender consistent respect from all the nations. Thank you very much.